Hello, everybody. Welcome back once again to the Crew First Culture Podcast. This is Jeremy. And I, once again, I am excited to not only have one friend as a guest, but two as a guest today. And this is a an episode that I've really, really been looking forward to for quite a while. I think these two have felt the same way. And so today I have with me Olivia Mead and Eric Brenneman of Yoga for First Responders. So how are you both doing? Good. I'm so happy to be back with you. Yeah, Jeremy, it's awesome. I'm excited for this one. I'm going to get to nerd out for a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, so I I have had both of you on before. We, I I honestly, I can't remember everything we talked about. I know that we really focused a lot on yoga in general and, and kind of what you guys are, are doing as a an organization. I don't remember if we got into breathing much. I'm sure we touched on it, but that is what we're going to be talking about today. Just really, really digging deep on breathing, the importance of breathing, the the physiology of breathing and and everywhere in between and and around. So looking forward to that. I am glad to have both of you here with me and and the knowledge you bring with me. And so with that being any further before we start, do you guys have anything else that you want to add before we get into it? Well, I'll just say that, um, you know, yeah, we primarily did talk about yoga and what we do as an organization, but I have to remind everyone that breathing is the crux of yoga. It's what makes it different than you can do the the shapes, a yoga shape anywhere you want. It doesn't mean that you're doing yoga because you're creating a warrior two shape or a tree pose shape. What makes it yoga is the breath work, the measured breathing patterns that you're creating. And it's through measured breathing patterns that you can then assess your mindset and the nervous system. So the nervous system and the mind and the breath are all connected. They're working in tandem. And so essentially one affects the other. And what we can directly affect is our breathing patterns. Breath is part of the autonomic nervous system. So it happens involuntarily, thank God. Uh, Otherwise, none of us would be here. Um, But it is something we can also control. So we share it with our nervous system. And I describe it as a, that's the portal that allows us to get into the nervous system and brain, which is what we're going to talk about, what happens when we're inside doing these manipulations. But I want to make it clear that um, I was I was actually uh, doing a presentation earlier today on mindfulness. And I, a a lot of people do kind of differentiate yoga, mindfulness, meditation, tactical, you know, breath work. Yoga encompasses all of it. But the primary tool is the breath work and the awareness of the breath. So even though this particular episode, we're focusing on the physiology of breath, I want everyone to know that that is the yoga. So if you only have the physical capacity to sit on a couch for whatever reason, you're injured, there's light duty, whatever. If you practice the breath work, you are practicing a daily yoga practice. And so just uh, to make that clear for anyone listening. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you said that kind of put a little bit more you know, light into some of those things that, that I wouldn't have thought about. So thank you for that. So really kind of to get going, Eric's got us a little, little, uh, what am I, I'm, I'm losing my track here. A little Check notes, <laughs> yeah, the, a little checklist uh, of things that, that we're going to go through. And, and so starting out and obviously it's a great place to start is just the basic physiology of breathing. And so like I talked to you guys before we started, I I am just kind of a a person that is giving a platform for you to to just go at it. So however you want to do it, whoever wants to talk, whatever order you want to do, we'll just start hammering out some of these topics. So basic physiology. Yeah, awesome. Um, coming from the fire service, and I know your audience is mainly fire service, uh, it's amazing how little we actually pay attention to our breathing. Uh, if I ask most people, I'm like, I go and talk with them and say, Hey, have you paid attention? When was the last time you thought about a breath that you took? 
uh, most of them will raise a hand because they will, we do teach like, hey, if things are going sideways in, a, in the fire service, that we stop, take a breath, uh, get ourselves squared away and get back to work. So we're, there is the, there are those moments where we're taking those conscious breaths. But if it's on a truly day-to-day basis, and when was the last time you thought about how you're breathing? Most people may even say never. They've never actually thought about how am I breathing other than uh, when they get gassed. Uh, they're like... <laughs> holy crap, <laughs> I'm breathing way too fast. Um, and I mean, we've seen it on the fire ground. You know, that guy that comes out of the house fire with the pack literally frozen to their back. I mean, you can be <laughs> fighting a fire in Phoenix, Arizona with 120 degrees heat. They still walk out of structure fire and their pack is literally frozen to their back because uh, because they just sucked that thing down. And that's when they think about, man, maybe I'm breathing too much, you know? Can, or, can I do a metaphor, a little metaphor of what you're exactly talking about? I'm a civilian. I'm a yoga teacher. I went through fire academy to build yoga for first responders, but just so your listeners have some background, I'm, I, I am a civilian. And one of the reasons I started yoga for first responders is no one thinks about first responders and their mental health and anything like that until they need a first responder, right? They're, they know they're going to show up but no one thinks about them and what's going on and what they need until they need it. And I thought it was about time we took care of, you know, of this team that takes care of us. And I just realized it's the same thing with the breath work. You know, it's going to be there for you. You know, you know, you're breathing until like Eric said, until you get to the point where you're like, Oh my God, my breath, I need it. And is your breath up to the task of serving you just like we hope first responders are up to the task of serving their community is our breath up to the task for serving us and just like first responders need the training that we're offering our breath also needs training um to be there for us so i just just hearing what you said eric reminded me of kind of how this organization was even born yeah yeah, totally So as a reminder, when we breathe, we inhale through our nose, hopefully. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. Uh, The air flows down into our trachea, down into our lungs, uh, and then goes out from there. Why it's important to talk about basic physiology, though, is a couple of the key muscle groups that I want to really start to point out are the diaphragm, uh, number one, because of the critical importance the diaphragm plays in our breathing. Uh, and then the accessory accessory muscles are intercostal uh, muscles. We, and these are all things that we remember from paramedic school hearing about. I mean, everybody knows that you measure down from the left clavicle, three or four intercostal spaces, whatever it is for, for doing work around the heart or for putting on your EKG uh, type leads. And I wasn't a paramedic, I was a firefighter, let's be honest. And so <laughs> this is all stuff that I've learned after the fact, but it's critically important. And so as we go through life and especially uh, life with stressful jobs, and that would be anybody listening to this podcast, because if you are an adult human being in the world today, you have a stressful job. And that is literally called surviving at this point um, because of the stressors we've put into our lives besides 911 calls for those in public service, but carrying around the little black boxes in our pockets all day long. Uh, getting the pings of emails and text messages and everything else we can show that we are higher stressed beings now than we have been in history. And so as we go through life and take on that stress of life, um, we our breathing patterns change. And so we actually find ourselves breathing less downwind the diaphragm down in the belly. Now there's a misnomer that the diaphragm freezes up and we don't use it anymore. Um, or when people kind of make this connotation that if I have to do diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, My diaphragm fires up every time I breathe. It does, but it can actually start to get a little bit hardened, uh, just like any other muscle group. And so it doesn't move as much as it's supposed to. Um, And so that's why we need to start to focus back in on the diaphragm movement. And so if the diaphragm starts to get hard and starts to harden up, we then start to breathe through our accessory muscles. So we're breathing through our intercostals and more uh, higher up into our chest. And the issues with that is, as we all know from basic physiology, where the uh, blood oxygen exchange happens is actually in the lower lobes of the lungs. And so just by thinking about it, if I'm only breathing high and tight in my chest, I'm not actually getting that full oxygen exchange down at that cellular level where I need to which isn't going to perpetuate the problem of I need to feel feel like I need to breathe in again sooner uh, because of that improper exchange taking place at the bottom of, of our lungs. And so from a very, very basic standpoint, if we can think about and re-engage uh, 
that basic physiology of breathing low into our lungs. It'll help activate that diaphragm, pulling the oxygen down a, a little bit further. The other key piece about breathing down further, as I hit on it at the beginning, was about breathing through the nose. And I said, hopefully we're breathing through our nose. Uh, through a lot of studies, I'm going to reference a lot of uh, materials from a book called The Breathing Cure uh, by Patrick McCown. It's a fantastic resource for anybody that wants to dive into this deeper. Uh, but he's critical about breathing through our nose. And even if we have things such as deviated septums, I've heard this a lot of time, I have a deviated septum, I can no longer breathe through my nose. Research actually shows it's with training, just like any other kind of physiological training, you can start to breathe through your nose again, even with a deviated septum. So don't let that hold you back. Um, really start to work on these things as we go through. Because the importance about breathing through our nose uh, from a basic physiological standpoint is it actually introduces more nitric oxide into our systems. We take in more nitric oxide through our nasal cavity than through um, our mouth. And why that's important is, is that as we're breathing into the nose through that smaller space, it constricts the airflow. So it actually forces the air deeper into the lungs. And that higher level of nitric oxide actually works as a um, lubricant um, to help the oxygen get down deeper into the lungs and then work through that oxygen uh, blood exchange a little bit easier. And so we as humans actually want higher levels of nitric oxide because it can actually help lower our blood pressure. Uh, it can help make that oxygen exchange happen more effectively. And then it's going to naturally slow our breathing down, um, which is a really, really critical piece when we talk a little bit later about um, one of our breath techniques for increased stamina and our CO2 drive. And so um, to the factor, uh, as a reminder to folks, um, when we breathe, we think it's we're oxygen driven. It's not. Um, what in the fire service, for example, if we have somebody that's hyperventilating, one of the techniques that we're taught is to help have them rebreathe a little bit. So like the old cliche is to have them breathe into a paper bag, yeah. right? So they can breathe back in the paper bag. Mm -hmm. And the reason what hap is happening when we're doing that is, is if we're hyperventilating, we're actually blowing off our CO2. And so that's causing us to, to want to um, breathe more. So it's that self-destructive loop. And so by breathing some of that CO2 carbon dioxide back in, it'll actually slow our drive to breathe back down a little bit uh, there. And so as the CO2 increases in our blood system, it trips us that we need to breathe. Um, and as our CO2 drops um, in our blood system, uh, it tells us to hold on to our breath. So um, if, if we have, excuse me, I said that backward. As the CO2 levels increase uh, in our blood system, it's going to tell us to breathe, right? Am I saying that correctly, Olivia? I said that correctly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. <laughs> um, I'm going off for a minute there. So I'm going to take a break. With, well, with the nose breathing and mouth breathing, what's interesting too is if you're in a profession or part of your profession is talking a lot, you are putting yourself in a stress response because of the breathing patterns happening through the mouth. So, um, you know, I'll do a lot of presenting and a lot of teaching and I'm at the end of the day, I'm just wiped. Why am I wiped? I have been in an activated state the whole time because of the breathing requirements of the mouth. So when we're not breathing, like I was just actually noting, um, you know, Jeremy, you listening just to us right now, your lips are shut and you are you are nose breathing, but those who are talking a lot are constantly mouth breathing and their nervous system is activated and they don't even, they, they don't think they've been in an activating situation per se. Um, so that's just another interesting thing to note about how often these benign things are affecting our nervous system. Yep. Is that kind of basically wrapping up your, your, the physiology? <laughs> All right. I yeah, think I will. some people on some basic physiology because it goes a little bit deeper than people think. But. Well, and I want to clarify the thing, Eric, that you were saying, did I say that backwards or whatever, is not only of the tripping our system to, okay, now it's time to take a breath, but also the effectiveness of the O2. And so like with the higher levels of CO2, when the bit of oxygen comes in, it is more effective, right? So when we have lower levels of CO2, we may still be tripped to breathe, you know, but the O2 isn't um, 
what do you call it? It's not registering in the body. And so it requires us to bring in more. So the, uh, the CO2 is down, we're sucking O2, but it's not effective. So I guess what I would say is the higher the CO2, the more effective the O2 is on our tissues, meaning we need less air to be effective. And that obviously you could probably already think of why that's good for fire service, which we'll go into more later. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And just, and I know we'll get into it more, but just the little that I've learned since meeting you all is I find myself all the time, just like you said, just stopping and and thinking about and and it's weird because i don't think that that's ever been the thing for me to do and even a couple of uh, of guys on my crew had mentioned here within the past couple weeks about doing the same thing about thinking about nose breathing as opposed to just always with your mouth and and again that's conversation that that we have never had before so it's, well, it's cool to kind of start to see, you know, it, it put into to yeah. action. Another thing you can remind them to, or just think about in general, is even the act of thinking about your breath, not even making an adjustment to from mouth to nose. It literally sends, it's a different part of your brain that's functioning. It's the prefrontal cortex. When I'm not thinking about my breath, it is really easy for me to have an amygdala hijack and go back into my survival mode. But just being like, wait, am I... Am I breathing? So my brain is sending a signal to my belly. Am I belly breathing right now? Am I nose breathing? Automatically, you are in this moment, aware of the moment, which is mindfulness, mindfulness by the way, yeah. tying in all this other stuff. Yeah. And your prefrontal cortex just boom, fired up, getting you present. So even if you're in a situation and you feel yourself getting out of control, even the act of noticing the breath before you even make any adjustments brings you back into the moment. Gotcha. Perfect. So next on our list is is HRV. And that for anybody that hasn't heard of it is is heart rate variability. And this is something that man is is super interesting for me. I'm I'm sure I just have barely brushed the edges of, of what all is involved in it. But talk to us a little bit about heart rate variability and the importance of of it what it plays in our bodies and in our daily life. Yeah. So uh, for simple pur- purposes, heart rate variability is the gap, the space between our heartbeats. So uh, if our heart is working in a proper condition, as we inhale, we're actually stepping on the gas pedal of our nervous system a little bit. So as we inhale, you can think that your heart rate should actually speed up a little bit. And as we exhale, we're hitting the brake pedal, the parasympathetic nervous system. And so as we exhale, our heart should slow down a little bit. And so if you put literally like a pulse ox with that uh, keeps track of your pulse rate on it, you can literally watch this happen. Um, you can watch as you inhale that the gaps between your heartbeats get a little bit smaller because your heart rate's increasing. And as you exhale, the gaps between your heartbeats get a little bit bigger as you're exhaling. And so the wider those gaps can be, uh, the more fluctuation that there is between heartbeats as you're inhaling and exhaling, the better off you are. That's considered high heart rate variability. Low heart rate variability uh, is when our hearts are beating very metronomically, very, very consistently, that there's no fluctuation from when we inhale to when we exhale. And so you can think of setting a metronome for 115 beats per minute and just don't Dun, 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 and there's no fluctuation in it. That's considered low heart rate variability uh, and is extremely detrimental to our health, actually. And so, again, we were talking about the stress effects on breathing higher into our chest and breathing shallower. Stress also plays a part impact uh, on that heart rate variability. And as we lead stressful lives, we find that we tend to decrease our heart rate variability which comes along with a whole host of medical issues and medical problems because our heart when healthy is supposed to speed up and slow down and kind of fluctuate as we're doing things in life uh, versus just clicking and clocking away. 
And so we wonder why heart attacks are a leading cause of injury, if not death, in both law enforcement and the fire service worlds. And we often think at times it's from these sudden starts and sudden stops, like overnight and that kind of stuff, where yeah. if we wanted to dive into it, we could probably do some pretty interesting studies on impacts of heart rate variability because they show that low heart rate variability is a high indicator of a uh, heart attack. So uh, we could probably put heart rate variability, uh, heart rate monitors on our firefighters, on our law enforcement officers and find out most of us are walking around with low heart rate variability, which is a precursor to a heart attack, let alone the instant, the highest ups and downs. Now, one of the crazy things about this, Jeremy, uh, that we learned, this is the anecdotal evidence that blew my mind when I learned this, because we can hear about it and we can get it. And we know that high heart rate variability is good, but we had a pediatric emergency room physician in one of our classes. And she raised her hand uh, as we were working through this heart rate variability exercise. And she said, the scary part about this is, is that when we're adults, we think that having a low heart rate variability is good. We think that if it just metronomically ticks away, that that's good. She said, as a pediatric emergency room physician, if I have a child come in with low heart rate variability so that their, their heart is just dumping away, there's no variations in it, that's when we call the crash cart because they're about to die. And that blew my mind. I mean, yeah. it gave, gives me chills every time I say it because it just puts it into perfect pointed focus yeah. of how critical increasing our heart rate variability is. Because when we're the youngest and healthiest in our lives, if we have a low heart rate variability, they're ready for us to die. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. And so yeah. it, the conversation around HRV from that standpoint alone has to become more mainstream, more common uh, amongst our peers. And so one of the critical ways to train heart rate variability is through breath work. So it's not, not by accident that I wanted to talk about that at the, as a foundational piece. Um, because again, as we train our breath work and we're going to go through uh, in two more bullet points about activating the calm button in our nervous system, that as we train good at inhales and good slow exhales, you'll actually start to feel and notice your heart rate speeding up on inhales and slowing down on exhales. And that's that variability piece of it. And it takes training and it takes time, but it can be improved upon. Um, I want to show a graph of this, if I may, I can, I'll share my screen for anyone who's watching this to demonstrate what Eric's talking about. So, um, heart rate variability is the shows if our systems are in coherence, working optimally. And when we're in coherence and working optimally, um, the studies have shown that we are performing at our best. We're, we're using the least amount of energy for the highest level of performance. So obviously you always want in a critical situation to be in a coherent state. So um, I'll just give, I'll show an example here from, uh, if you can see here, this is one of our presentations. Um, on the top here is what it looks like on a biofeedback machine when someone is not in a coherent state, when they have low heart rate variability, that's how this is represented. And then the graph below it is someone who is in a coherent state and is represented on the graph by very even, um, you know, up and down lines. Do not <laughs> confuse that for even spaces between heartbeats. I think that's where the confusion comes in. This is just what the biofeedback machine represents. Okay. So this is officially from heart math. This represents what coherence looks like in terms of heart rhythm patterns. This next thing here is our biofeedback machine. And this is a law enforcement officer. We hooked up to it here on the left, um, is him sitting in front of his peers. And I asked him to do math problems. I asked him to sing the national anthem. I put him under stress. And if you see here compared to here, he is not in a coherent state where, so right about here, I would say, um, I start to teach him breath work. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. For those that can't see it. Uh, it's about two and a half minutes into the exercise. The entire exercise is seven minutes long. So she starts breath work at about the two and a half minute mark. Yeah. 
And so then about at the three minute mark, there is a line that's indicating he has reached a coherent state. And as you can see from the graph afterwards, compared to our example here, he then reaches a nice even coherent state. And what I introduced to him at the two minute 30 second mark was our coherency breathwork technique, which we are going to teach you on this podcast. So by simply changing his breath patterning on his own. We also had him do a little bit of cognitive behavioral techniques that we add in, but primarily the breath. He's able to put himself in a coherent state. And this entire exercise from when he sat down to stood up is seven minutes. That's how fast you are able to change your nervous system if needed. Um, so this just shows the, the, power that, you know, if you are someone who is living not in a coherent state with low HRV, how easily it can be fixed if you have the tools. And that's, this is something that, you know, Eric is, well, I, I'm sure both of you, you, Olivia has been a part of the, the developing high performance class before, well before me. So I'm sure you both have been doing this as part of that class, but I personally have seen it a couple of times when Eric has done it to some students and man, it is, it is, it is pretty cool to sit there and see it in real time, just kind of play out like you're talking about. And, and so uh, it's, it's impressive for sure, just to see how, you know, maybe a couple cycles of, of these different techniques that we're going to go through of breathing really makes a, a huge impact on your body. So it is pretty cool. Yeah. And the important thing there is it takes it out of this whole woo woo, hippy dippy esoteric like esoteric like breath yeah. weird to rock solid science i mean when you can yeah. literally see it changing on the screen in front of you if somebody else doing the breathwork patterning that's where we win people over because it's like oh shit now i can actually train this just like i train my burpees in the gym uh, and watch you know. improvement you can actually yeah, yeah. I think that's what's such an issue about training the subtle subtle body, which is the brain and nervous system, is that we can't, it's really hard for us to see results. We can maybe feel them. We can't maybe explain how it feels. Um, whereas you can see how many burpees you can do. You can see yeah. yourself improve. So with biofeedback machines like this, you can actually watch yourself improve your autonomic fitness. And that's pretty cool. Awesome. So next on our list is diaphragm breathing. So I'm, yeah. I'm having a feeling this is, we're, we're now moving into the physical part of the, the portion of this program. So <laughs> lead us into how to properly breathe. Yeah. So diaphragmatic breath, uh, when, when we tell people to take a big breath, in, like, Hey man, calm down, take a breath. Like most of us still, even at that point, when we take a breath in, we still raise our shoulders up, breathe in through our chest and take a big chest breath in. And so that's not quite what we're trying to get at. And so we take, say here at Yoga First Responders, we take all of these concepts and make them tactical and practical. So that way you know the exact steps to take to put these things into place. So a bit of the science real quick behind diaphragmatic breathing and why it's critically important tying back into HRV, and it's not by accident that we put these in this order, is that by engaging the diaphragm, so as the diaphragm is that muscle that sits at the bottom of our lungs, so as we inhale, the diaphragm uh, flattens out so that air can come into the lungs, and as we exhale, the diaphragm goes back up into its kind of umbrella-shaped dome shape uh, on the bottom of the lungs. Now, why that's important is, is that as that diaphragm begins to move more, as we breathe better uh, using the diaphragm, is that the diaphragm is actually going to massage the vagus nerve. If uh, your listeners want to take uh, a moment to dive down rabbit holes, hit pause and Google search vagus nerve. And your mind's going to be blown about how important this system of nerves is that runs from literally the brainstem all the way down through your toes, out to your fingertips. And they're all connected and it's all connected and goes through this central point uh, that then uh, intersects with the diaphragm. And so by the diaphragm massaging the vagus nerve, it's actually going to send signals back up to your brain uh, that your body's in a calm, safe state. Uh, so you can activate the parasympathetic nervous system, take our foot off the gas pedal, take ourselves out of fight or flight freeze uh, moments, and which is why it's important to breathe with that diaphragm. 
another really, really fascinating point about the diaphragm and why breathing, what's it is important is, is this comes back out of that breathing cure book by Patrick McCown. So many of us in public safety have low back pain and we can't get rid of it. Uh, we've tried physical therapy. We've tried uh, going to the doctor. We've tried different exercises. And I couldn't believe this study when I read it, but they actually go through and show that they took a cohort of people that had consistent low back pain and had no relief through standard cares of chiropractic, PT, things like that. They did breath retraining on them. So it taught them how to breathe through their nose down in their diaphragm using their belly breath. And all of them had low back pain relief. Because when we think about it, our low back isn't supported by any skeletal systems. It's only supported by the musculature of our core. And so we're often told to tighten our core and work on our core, which is going to help alleviate low back pain. But most of us go to the gym and start doing crunches or try to do like back extensions, thinking we're working the core. But think about it. Every time you breathe with that diaphragm, as it pushes down, it creates intra-abdominal pressure down in your belly area. So that actually fires up every single one of your core muscles all the way around, which then strengthens them, which then helps support that low back and that lumbar spine. So it's not by accident that if you breathe with your diaphragm down your belly, you're literally firing up your core and strengthening it every time you take a breath, which then leads to stronger low back, supported lumbar spine, lower incidence of pain in that low back. So super fascinating stuff when you tie it all together, which is why I love this stuff and nerd out on it. But Olivia, do you want to teach proper sure. breathing? Yeah. So um, I think it's lower than you, than a lot of people think. So instead of having your hand on your belly button, see if you can go even like below your belt line, very, very low. And also take your other hand and place it on your low back. A great way to also feel this if you know, you're listening is to lay on your belly. So lay in a prone position and place something like a shoe or whatever on your low back. What we're trying to do is inflate as low as possible and also inflate the back muscles. It feels impossible, but as Eric said, <laughs> this is training and the diaphragm is a muscle. All respiration is mus our muscles that we never train. So they're going to be weak and it's going to be hard to get them to do what you want them to do. But with training, um, it will happen. But as you inhale, see if you can isolate the chest and ribs for now and uh, not breathe up here and just inflate the very low belly and see if you can feel the back muscles expand against your hand behind you. And then exhale and it deflates like a balloon. Inhale, we inflate it and exhale, we deflate. And again, it's someone might be saying, I literally cannot get it to move. This is very normal. The more you do it, you'll start connecting those signals again, laying on your belly. So the belly presses against the floor, getting something to have some weight on your low back. And you feel like you're lifting it up with those muscles will be helpful. So with that, take the hand that's on the back and then put it on the waist, like Superman. So between your hip bone and your rib cage. So the cummerbund like area, and then not only feel the low, low belly and the and low back. cummerbund area, she means where your SCBA lap strap goes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she's, a she's a performer. She knows the word cummerbund. cummerbund. It's in one of our, it's in one of our dialogues on teaching yeah. us on a reminder. I was like, or where like the SCBA strap goes. Tuxedos. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's actually, well, and this is a great point, actually, when you are tightening the SCBA straps and it feels constrictive. This is actually a gift because when you have something pressing against you, you can engage those muscles and press against it. For instance, if I just stuck my hand out like this, my muscles are not engaged. But if you were had your hand pressing and I was pressing against it, then my muscles engage. So if you want to feel the respiration muscles, press against the SCBA straps and they'll feel more, that's a great tool to feel them more engaged. So your hand is around where the waist strap is, your hands on your low belly. So you press into the belly and the low back, and then you are pushing the belt away from you, pushing against it. And then as you exhale, you release. So there's a little bit less tension on the belt. 
Inhale, you press against the belt till it feels super tight. And you pause and then you exhale and give yourself a little relief. Make sure you are not at this moment, not breathing into the ribs or the chest quite yet. We are focused all down here on like a band around your waist. It's going to take practice, but I assure you that it will improve. And the more you focus on it, you're also firing up the prefrontal cortex. Yeah. And so just like any of our trainings, the more we train on these skills, the, the basic skills, the more we're going to fall back into them. And that's the goal. That's the goal. Eventually is it like this patterning, this diaphragmatic breathing becomes your natural breath again. So you don't have to think about it. It's like, Oh, when you think about it, it's like, Oh, I am breathing down into my belly. And so even though it feels weird to start with, I mean, think back to the first time you literally put your bunker gear on like firefighter scale one, uh, Think about how awkward that was. And all of a sudden the academy instructor was like, all right, now we're going to do it in less than 60 seconds. Ready, go. And you're flailing all over the place and you're doing it for put, take three minutes to put your gear on. But over time, obviously that time goes down, right? So the, this is, this is breath work technique skill number one, like breathing one, not even one-on-one yet, breathing one. So <laughs> that, that diaphragmatic breath, just focus in on that. Uh, and know that as you do this and think about it, it does become that fallback. It becomes your standard default mode of breathing. So the diaphragm is is a powerful, powerful tool because then uh, it's going to help us activate the calm button, which now goes into a resource that we do have. Jeremy has some of these. I hope you can put a link to it on your show notes uh, down yep. at the bottom too is a PDF. Um, it's a handy guide, uh, a breathwork guide. So and go so ahead and just... tell, just tell, tell them the link just in case somebody wants to to write it down real quick, but I'll, I'll put it in the notes as well. Yeah. So you can find it uh, on our website, yoga for first responders.org forward slash store. Uh, it's in, it's as a PDF in there that you can download pretty. I think we do have a nominal price on that store, um, but it's, pretty easy to use. Um, and if you buy something from Jeremy's, uh, shop, I think he actually has some of these to drop in. So yep. cool. So this technique, um, is the very first one, uh, on the card. It's called three steps to activate the calm button. So the, how this card works is, is that when I created it, we have the, each one of these breathwork patternings on the back of the card has a name for it. But it doesn't do us much good uh, if I think of, oh, this is the physiological side. I wanted it to be quick and easy uh, for folks that are reading the card as to know when to use the technique. So why would I use it? So that's what the title is uh, across the card uh, when you see those. So the title for this one is Three Steps to Activate the Calm Button. And we're going to teach you all these techniques. So you don't even have to find the card. You're going to have this and just hit replay on this uh, podcast again. And you'll have all these techniques in your pocket uh, whenever you need them. So uh, the three steps to activate the calm button, uh, two of the steps we've already discussed with you. We're just going to put them together. So Olivia is a fantastic coach. <laughs> So the ones we've covered already, and so you'll know why, um, are nose breathing and belly breathing. And the reason we call this the calm button is we like to describe it, like I mentioned, you know, measuring and manipulating your breath patterns is like going into the portal and into your nervous system. And when you're in your nervous system, it's like there are a bunch of levers and buttons and you can now control this computer. So you see this big button that says calm button and I'm getting activated and I want to get calm. So I'm going to hit it. So it's the nose breathing and the belly breathing. So those are two of the three steps we've already covered. So as you practice the really low band inflating and deflating, it should always be through the nose. And then the third step, and this actually goes back to part of our explanation with HRV, is that the exhale needs to be longer than the inhale. So um, when Eric was talking about when we inhale, we activate a little bit. When we exhale, we then get back into baseline and it goes back and forth and back and forth. So if we want to hit the brake harder than we're hitting the gas, we need to extend the exhale longer than the inhale. If we were to do the opposite of these three steps, so instead of nose breathing, I'm going to mouth breathe. Instead of belly breathing, I'm going to chest breathe. And instead of a long exhale, I'm going to do a short exhale. And it looks like this. 
now it's I'm into attack. <laughs> yeah, I'm into hyperventilating. Now I'm into very poor HRV, et cetera, et cetera. So all we're doing is the opposite: nose breathing, low belly breathing, and a long exhale. And I do need to say, especially if you're new to this, you have to give it more than just one breath. You can't say, "Okay, one breath, I'm not fixed yet." Um, there was a period of my time where I was getting these random anxiety attacks, specifically when I was driving. I mean, it was very, very random. And what I would tell myself, because I knew these techniques, is I'd look at the clock in my car, and as I would make my way to an exit so I could get off and like be safe while this was happening, I would look at the clock and I would say, I'm going to do the calm button for at least three minutes. Well, by the time I actually was doing it and was changing lanes to get to the nearest exit, I was fine. So again, you can't just be three breaths, the shit's not working. It's you have to give your nervous system time to reap the effects of it. Yeah. And that's actually really, really important. There's a, another book that I'm reading right now called the language of breath. Um, as I said, I'm a breath nerd. And so half the books on my bookshelf are breath related. Um, uh, and the, I really like the analogy that this author uses. And he says that like, once we start to learn these techniques, it's literally learning the language of our body and nervous system. So, uh, he makes the argument that we all still, uh, modern medicine still separates the mind and body. We think that's two separate things. It's not, it's, we're all one being, but we have to learn the language between the body and the mind and the connection between the two, as Olivia said, is the breath work, is the breath. And so we need to learn this language. So just like you wouldn't expect to pick up a book in Spanish and be able to read it today, you'd want to learn some of the basics and then you'd be able to pick up that book and read it. These are the foundational trainings. I'm just going to keep reiterating that throughout the episode because you are learning this new language of affecting your nervous system, affecting your uh, brainwave patterning through your breath. And so the first time you do it, you may be like, man, this is bullshit. I don't feel anything, uh, but work with it. Give it some time uh, and learn these, learn to learn this language. So we talked about diaphragm breathing and, and the importance of that. That's kind of the, the, this, the one part of the breathing. So the next on the list that we're going to talk about is three-part breathing. And again, really foundational. This seems like everything you guys, everything I see from you guys, it's it's three-part breathing. And all of your your videos on your websites and things like that, three-part breathing is really big. So tell us about three-part breathing. Yeah, so we talked about the calm button, which we focused on belly breathing primarily because again, this that's when I'm activated, I need to hit the brake. Um, but if we're not in an activated state necessarily where we're using the calm button and we're training, the baseline of our training, the foundation is the three-part breathing. For us, when we do our yoga, the, the physical aspect of yoga is placed upon the breath. The breath happens first, and then the yoga is the yoga physical part is happening from there. So three part breath again, same thing. We're starting in the through the nose, all the elements of the column button. But now, so we had our hands on the waist area and the belly. Now you're going to take the hand that was on the where the belly strap is, and you're going to lift it a little bit higher to the ribs. So if anyone has worn a tactical or ballistic vest, it's the same sort of pressure. Yeah, so the shoulder straps, right? The shoulder straps of the SCBA. Um, it's that same sort of pressure, but now we're putting it on the ribs and the torso, and that's pressing in. And now you have something up in the rib cage to press against. So you're pressing the belly inflates, then the ribs, and there are muscles around the ribs called intercostal muscles. And these are also very weak if you don't exercise them. So when you expand the ribs, the muscles are stretching. When you hold the ribs out, they're strengthening. And so a lot of times when you start your breath work training, you will be sore in your ribs from expanding and you know deflating the ribs back and forth. So the belly expands, you're continuing to inhale, right? We can't inhale fast. It's this inhale that creates the belly to inflate, then the ribs. And then we continue the inhale up to the collar bones. When we ask people to take a big breath, you may see someone lift their shoulders. The shoulders have are not part of the respiration system. 
They don't give you more breath or more room. And in fact, lifting your shoulders is an indicator, a physical indicator to your brain that things are unsafe. So it is important to keep the shoulders down. So the full three-part breath is the belly engaging and opening up. You continue on that same inhale and the rib cage opens up. You continue on that same inhale into the chest and you can feel the shoulder blades open up and widen this way. So you're getting really large in your um, torso. Then as you exhale, we, we reverse it. We feel the shoulder blades come back in. Although the chest depresses, we don't sink in our spine. We stay aligned in the spine. The ribs come together and then there's a slight pull in of the navel towards the spine. So we inhale from the bottom up. I had someone describe it once like filling an air mattress. <laughs> you're inflating from the bottom and coming up, pause, and you're deflating from the top down. Meanwhile, you're doing this through the nose and you're extending the exhale. That's the baseline. And when we're practicing yoga, we start manipulating our breath and we don't stop for the whole practice. The baseline is a three-part breath. If we're doing other tactical breathwork techniques, then we'll add them on top of it. Like if we're doing box breathing or some of the other things we'll introduce you to, those techniques are happening on top of the three-part breath. Um, so that is our foundational technique, which is why it's mentioned constantly, um, because that is also our honing device to where we are neurologically. If I'm losing connection to my breath, it means I've lost connection to my nervous system. If I can't access my belly breathing, it means that I've lost, I'm in an activated state and I can't get back to a regulated state. So it's an indicator of what's happening mentally and neurologically. Well, I think you know, just just in personal moments, especially doing yoga with you guys, is it's just interesting that you get in a space where your body really needs breathing more than anything. That's the times when it's like you lock up and you know mm -hmm. you're you're stressed or you're you're stretched farther than normal or whatever, and you realize, okay, I got I got to breathe because I'm not breathing at all. But it's just it's just interesting to me that that exactly the opposite of what you need is what your body's trying to you know you got to fight against. So yeah, I mean think about it. Like every time you just even like get startled, like that breath literally gets taken away. Like that chest tightens down, right? I mean, so our physiology, it's not fair. It's kind of working against us in those fight or flight moments. But as we talk through this, we realize why we've got to retrain ourselves to go back uh into that proper breathing technique and uh, the reason why we use yoga is we can amplify the stress response little by little in an extremely calculated way so that the next time your body is under stress and pressure uh it's already been trained to breathe in this way under stress and so then once you master that then we dial up that stress response just a little bit more and then you learn to breathe under that stress response so the next time you're activated up to that level uh, you you have the, this foundational breathing technique in play and so that's why i really really like the methodology of yoga to do this work of course there's other uh methodologies out there um, I'm thinking the reason I brought that up is um, cold plunging has become a, a super big thing right now. But you watch anybody who has mastered the cold plunge and the first thing they learn to master is their breath because as soon as you hit the cold water, because of the mammalian dive reflex, it just throws your physiology it. all, exactly. <laughs> it throws everything out of whack, right? And so you just kind of like give into it and learn breathing, the breathing patterning to maintain it. And I actually finally saw somebody coaching this through in a really, really good way. They're like, if you get to the point where you jump into the water and you just start freaking out and your body locks up on you, you're training past your capacity. Like you need to dial the temperature of the water back, warm it up a little bit, and then work to the point where you're jumping into the ice water um, to do it properly. Yeah. And But that's why I really, really like yoga is we can just that dial, that stress dial can be so metered and we can just amplify it and turn it up just notch by notch by notch so that we can really work with people through these techniques. I want to advocate for our own bodies and nervous systems and stress response for, for a second, because I know it feels like it's working against us, but to be fair, the stress response, when we do have that tightening up and, oh, and back of the amygdala height, that's all 
created for our short-term survival, meaning there is a lion chasing us and we need 60 seconds, 30 seconds to turn into a superhero to save ourselves, right? We get this crazy amount of strength and uh, we can run faster than ever. And so that's why the physiology goes crazy because it's needed for that short-term survival. And then it does have I don't want to get too far into this, but we do have built-in capacity to regulate ourselves. The issue is, is we are built for the very short, um, you know, danger, unsafe time. And nowadays, typically, especially for a civilian, typically you're not going to find yourself in a short-term unsafe situation like that with a lion, you know, chasing you. But what we all find is long, longer term stressful situations. That's when the physiology of that true fight or flight or freeze is not working for us. So it feels like it's working against us because it is in the type of stress you're dealing with in fire service, you know, the sustained stress, which is why we have to have a training tool in place. But the reason that happens is because the stress response is built for short term survival. And in which case that's a very, very effective tool to go back into the amygdala to have huge spikes of cortisol and adrenaline. So I want to make sure we love that because that keeps us alive when we need to, but not in this modern day and age or in a, a career such as fire service. Yeah, which actually leads really, really well into the next type of breath technique that we want to teach, which is recovery breath. So that when we do feel that activation, okay, we feel activated. We gave you the simple steps to activate the calm button. And now if you want to be intentional with it, um, this is what we call recovery breath. On the card, it literally says for recovery. Um, and if you remember back to the three steps to activate the calm button, we're going to be breathing in through the nose, down into our belly and exhales longer than the inhale. So from here on out, all of the breathing patterns that we're going to give you, um, have some kind of count to them. And so when I say some kind of count, it's going to be a count of number of inhale during the inhale and a count during the exhale. But those ground rules that we started with that activating the calm button and three part breath still apply. So it's all of these are the foundation of belly ribs, chest, chest, ribs, belly. And I'd rather you do just belly breathing than belly ribs, chest, because if that's where you're at today, but the foundation main maintains for when we count for three, count for five, count for six, count for eight, 10, whatever the number is, it's that foundation of that three part breath. So it always starts there. So we're activated, Olivia. You got us activated. We're very grateful uh, that we're activated. Uh, now, how do we recover? Yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, love your stress response and nervous system for getting you into the focus you need for a real urgent situation. Um, but now maybe it's rehab. Maybe you're out, someone else is in, and you got to get yourself back for the next fight, the next section of this work time you have, um, recovery breath. So a uh, three-part breath is the baseline, as Eric said, and simply inhale for three and exhale for five. And it has to be an even count. So I don't want to inhale for three and then I exhale one, two, I'm out of breath, three, four, five. It's an even exhale for five. And the, the last little drips of breath are done right at the count of five. So I inhale. And what's great about this is especially with the three, you've got three parts to the three part breath, right? So inhale belly one, ribs two, chest three. And then as you exhale and descend the breath out, it's five, four, three, two, and one. So what we're doing is amplifying the part of the calm button, which is extending the exhale. You may think you're extending the exhale, but we're really making sure you do. Um, as you uh, train in this, you may be able to do five to seven, right? The, the ratio doesn't matter as much as extending the exhale, but really attach a count to it. I find especially after activation, three, five is probably the tops that you can go just because you are coming from an activated state. And uh, the question again, a lot, I get a lot is, I can't even access three, five. I can't, I'm, all, I'm too activated. Start with one, two, you know, start with two, four, and then eventually get to three, five. 
Another thing with counting is, again, it brings the mind in the present moment. If the mind is spinning, you bring it back by simply counting three, five. So not only is it a nervous system technique, um, it's brain training as well. And so something else I'll throw in there that that I've also heard from you all with that three, five count is turning it into words, you know, using words the same, which what I've heard from you all is, is I am calm. I am in control. And that basically is, that is your three. I am calm and your five going out. I am in control. And so that's just, just another way. If, if you have a saying or, or whatever that, that kind of corresponds with that, or you can use that right there, but just another way to, to do it. That's yeah. absolutely it. And you don't even have to make it as nice as that. You can add, you know, you could add swear words in it. You can add whatever it is that gets your brain in it. Like I fucking got this, whatever it is. The reason we like I'm calm and in control, as you mentioned, Jeremy, is it's the three, five syllables. So it helps keep you in that breath patterning. Um, but adding a phrase to the breath work is only more effective at focusing the brain. Yeah. And I'm going to advocate here for I am calm, I'm in control in this moment <laughs> with this breath patterning. And the reason why is we can have a whole nother episode on the science behind uh, what we call cognitive de cognitive declarations, but it's these self phrases, these self, the self talk. And so real briefly, what the research shows is that um, not only can we affect our HRV through our breathing patterns, but literally how you think can affect your HRV. And so by literally just thinking to yourself, even if you're not, just by thinking to yourself, I am calm, I'm in control, yeah. you're actually going to increase your HRV and put yourself into more of a parasympathetic response. And so the reason why it's important then to do the breath work, the in for three, out for five, and the cognitive declaration is that we're now working from a bottom up with approach with the breath. So we're using the body uh, to impact the mind and we're using the mind to impact the body. And so it's actually twofold. It's actually a really, really special sauce when you add the two of those things together. And so I am calm, I'm in control is an extremely powerful phrase with th that in for three, out for five. So that's a key like that's a, that's a red alarm bell, like takeaway from the podcast. I, in for three, out for five, I am calm. I'm in control. That's the phrase in the graph I showed earlier, where I said we were using breath work plus cognitive yep. behavioral technique. That's the phrase that we had him repeat. Gotcha. Good deal. Anything else on the, the recovery breath before we move on to the next one? No, that's a good segue right into it. Actually <laughs> talking, bringing back up that, that chart. So, um, the next one is for high performance uh, is a reason why I would use this. I call it, uh, we call it coherency breath. Uh, I'll give a little bit of the science behind it. Let Olivia coach it. Uh, it seems to be working well. And so some of the interesting things is we dive into the research of uh, optimal performance. And there are many, many ways to get to optimal performance. Uh, when they show that our mind, body, nervous system, one can even argue soul, uh, are working optimally together. As Olivia said, we're in a state of uh, coherence. There's no wasted energy. We can make decisions better. We're in the, a really, really solid spot to begin operating at a high level. And what the research shows is that we perform optimally when we're breathing between five and seven breaths per minute. And what's even more fascinating about this is, is that uh, all of the major religions of the world, when you chant their chants or say their prayers, it actually induces a breathing pattern of approximately 6.6 .6 breaths per minute. And the so, ancient ones specifically, the ancient like prayers and mantras and stuff, because those, those are the people who knew what was up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just fascinating. Like this isn't about the soul necessarily but it's just fascinating when like for the folks that are like if you do this study and read through this like it's not by accident this stuff's all tied together like our body performs optimally when we're feeling our best right and so we have taken the recovery breath uh, and we've changed it slightly so that the entire breath cycle takes 10 seconds and so for those that are not bad at math or that are bad at math i'll help you out if we have 
uh, 60 seconds in a minute, 10 seconds per breath cycle, it'll put us into a six breaths per minute, which is right in the optimal range of five to seven breaths per minute. Um, so this is why we call it coherency breath and why it works. Uh, and now Olivia. Yeah. So you'll, when you're doing coherency breath, the reason like we call it that, like Eric said, is if you had a biofeedback machine on you, you would see that it does is putting you in a coherent state. So it's recovery breath plus a two count hold. So same thing with three part breath. That's always the foundation. We inhale for three, but now we pause between inhale and exhale for a two count and then an even exhale for five. So that equals 10, um, which is then six breaths per minute. So inhale for three, belly, ribs, chest, obviously slower than that, belly, ribs, chest, pause, and exhale five, four, three, two, one. So it's three, two, five is coherency breath. Why that's a little bit different than recovery is in recovery breath, if I'm feeling activated and I just need to get to a state of recovery, three, five. But if I'm in an activated state and I'm still needing to work, I'm not in the recovery stage, shift to three, two, five, which is going to enhance the focus. So what that... You're, you're, you're telling us that basically that, that two second hold is the really only difference. And I mean, mm -hmm. so what, why, why, why does that two second hold make that big of a difference between something that, that you want to basically just calm yourself down mm -hmm. completely and, and just totally get yourself in a new spot and something that you want to just kind of maintain sharpness but can get back in control of your breathing and what what is the the science behind that or, or however you want to approach it yeah so that two seconds uh hold at the top so if we're just three five that's an eight second breath cycle with the two second hold it takes it to a 10 second breath cycle it doesn't seem like much but it moves us from seven and a half breaths per minute to okay six breaths per minute so back so to where you that that range that we're talking about gotcha right because we're coming up uh, two breath techniques later for increasing stamina. So if we do, and I'll nerd out on this in that section, but we're actually over breathing as a society. And so we're actually taking in too much oxygen into our system. And so think about when anything oxidizes too fast. I mean, we are in the fire service. If things oxidize too fast, it literally causes an explosion. Thank God we're not exploding all over like the card game, exploding kittens or whatever it's called. Uh, but slow oxidization is also rust. And so they actually can lead back to and show that higher levels of inflammation and things like that are caused by higher over oxygenation of our system. And so again, it's just a matter of working towards slowing down that breath cycle. So to move from seven and a half breaths per minute down to six, um, doesn't sound like much, but one and a half breaths a minute, every minute, every day adds up to adds up. And so it really just hits that brake pedal a little bit more. Um, and we hold on the inhale in this breath exercise because for public safety, especially, usually we are using this in a slightly more activated state. And so we need the oxygen in our system to allow the oxygen exchange to happen. You could hold the two count at the bottom of the exhale. We just find that it's not as friendly. Uh, and we are yep. going to be working as an, on an exercise in a bit. It's a lot easier to hold it at the top than, yeah, than at totally. the bottom. Yeah. And we're going to work on an exercise coming up that's actually hold on the bottom on the exhale for a very different purpose. Yeah, it's the difference between um, keeping the body. So if we're in this dance of activation regulation, if you're needing to perform, you do need slightly more of an activation. And breath retention, whether it's at the top or whether it's at the bottom, is um, like bicep curls for your nervous system and your stress response. And so when we do, like Eric said, holding the breath in at the top, it is going to be more for um, strengthening and shining the activating part of the nervous system. Whereas when we're holding the breath at the bottom, um, it's getting into the bore effect and it's more for, you know, the 
decreasing anxiety sort of part of it. So this is more on the performance realm. And, and that's why on the card, when you do say, okay, I need to get my performance right, it says for high performance, that's why it's a three, two, five there. But when we're getting into more of regulation, lessening anxiety, you'll see that the breath retention is also on the other side. So getting into so we're high performance now, next we're getting into under extreme stress. So yeah. first of all, what just kind of lay out what the difference that we're looking, just the situation, just general okay. situation. What, what is the difference that we're seeing in, in those two situations? Yeah. So uh, I call it under extreme stress. Uh, so this has been the think of a situation here. Uh, strong activation like you feel you feel your body activate it may be an email from the fire chief uh that sends you over the edge or, a yeah. or the guy that I was walks about to in say, to you're about to react you're about yeah. to write the email back right yeah <laughs> or or your spouse sends you a text message and you're at the station and you're like i can't handle this right now like like we know those moments yeah um or your kid does something that frustrates the the heck out of you you know uh, they just you just made this beautiful gourd made dinner and they dumped it all over their head because they're 12 months old like my little girl likes to do uh yeah. whatever it might be i mean uh, that's a but you know you know that you know that moment and so the reason why this is important is because this is about life training where you training these things for moments in life if we're, we just keep on isolated to this podcast it doesn't do any of us any good uh I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating, uh, for this on the fire ground, uh, but possibly I am too. I mean, if there's a moment where like you feel yourself, like I need to hit the brake pedal. Uh, and let's be honest, you have those moments, even no matter what you're doing, if you get hyper, hyper activated, um, you can pull these out. Uh, but typically the easy things for people to think of are the email from the fire chief, the text message from your spouse, your kid doing something stupid yeah. uh when you're just like i'm gonna lose it um this is for all type of events <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when you're about to emotionally react and you feel like you don't even have the capacity to mindfully respond yeah. right and i think that's actually really really important when you're going to emotionally react and whether that's at work at home at play wherever it's at um this is the breath technique for that moment because it's so 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 powerful uh, it's really been popularized by uh, Andrew Huberman. Uh, so Huberman yep. Lab, a lot of folks listen to that podcast. He calls it the physiological physiological sigh um, because when our bodies and nervous systems get extremely activated, and this is actually really something uh, to look for in people with kids uh, or if you have a dog, um, they do it as well. And so it's called the physiological side because it's actually a, a mammalian reflex uh, that we're kind of recreating uh, purposefully through breath work. So think about like a little baby crying super hard, their face is turning red uh, and they're just overly activated. We all know what a baby does in that moment and we can all probably mimic it. They start to go <laughs> and breathe in through their nose and exhale out and all of a sudden they're crying a little bit less. They're still crying, but there there definitely has been some kind of regulation, right? And so you can see it. And if a baby does it, that means it is a reflex. And you can see dogs do it too. You can watch dogs where they take that kind of couple inhale and then a sigh out when they're they're a bit activated. And so uh, that's the concept behind this breath technique. Uh, known as the physiological sigh, we have it on our card as when under extreme stress. So um, Olivia, do you want to coach this one? Yeah. And um, I actually add a little of my own special twist at the bottom of this breath. And Eric, I don't know if this is how Huberman teaches it. So you can correct it when I'm done. But um, this is how I teach it because I like to pair it with a real strong brake pedal. So, um, so I've actually also learned this as skip breath, which is an inhale and then a a sniff inward, right? So, and then from there, what I personally do is an SH exhale purposely because to slow down the breath. When you SH, it makes the breath slower to coming out. So I teach it as a big inhale, three part breath, sniff in, pause. Shh. 
for as long as you can, right? And then we do it again. Control, control, control. All the way out. And for me, that feels like a really good pairing. And I think the exhale is just normal for regular physiological size. Is that correct, Eric? Uh, the heat does coach it as to exhale slowly out the mouth. Okay. Uh, and so notice the key difference there, folks. And Olivia teaches it the same way. Is it everything that we've taught up to this point has been nose breathing as much as possible. But in this breath technique, the exhale is actually out the mouth, like flushing out some of that extra stress. Uh, you can, we all know that like, sometimes we just, our body we gives go, us that moment where we ah, things like, like that, just yeah. get it out. And so this breath technique does use that same thing. So no, that's exact. It's the same way as how, as how Huberman teaches it. Um, inhale completely at the top. You inhale a little bit more because that actually snaps open those, uh, the alveolar sacs at the bottom of our lungs so that we can actually oxygenate better. And then that long, slow exhale out. But three rounds of that, uh, if you're wearing uh, biofeedback, like your Apple watch or heart rate monitor, that kind of stuff, um, this one can drastically drop that heart rate uh, within just three rounds of it. And that's the point if we're physiologically activated, because we got that text message, do three rounds of this before you fire off the message that is going to cause you some issues when you get home from shift tomorrow. And, you know, if there were an order of things like, oh my God, I'm, I'm activated. I'm at work. I have a job to do. I'm in the middle of a call. What I might do is this physiological sigh, calm button, and then into coherency or recovery breath, like in that order, because the physiological side puts your hands back on the wheel, you know, the calm button, like gets your head straight. And then you can choose what do I need? Okay. I'm going to implement recovery or implement coherence. So I think that's a good order. If someone's feeling like I just need to grab onto the rope. Good deal. So that's, I mean, that, that, this is why I, I, have really looked forward to to doing this is just really kind of getting more insight on some of these you know the the times that they're most needed and and how they're really helping you know even even though I might be able to feel it might might not for some but but just kind of knowing why that is it's it's been really helpful here in it so what we have next is increased stamina yeah this one blows my mind for the fire service. So uh, the breath technique here uh, is different than any one that we've taught because we're now going to hold our breath out and train with holding our breath out. And the reason why it's important, especially for firefighters to train on holding their breath out is that we have to train having uh, the ability to have higher CO2 tolerance. And so this goes back to the original conversation that uh, the baroreceptors in our brain measure the carbon dioxide as carbon dioxide increases in our blood system. They get to a threshold. Those baroreceptors say, oh, too much carbon dioxide. Take that breath to lower carbon dioxide back down. That's I referred the, to it as the Borer effect earlier, which I don't think we had actually yeah. named it. So yeah. yeah, we're coming into it right now. So the reason why it's important to train those CO2 levels goes back to um, a phenomenon described in 1904. So 120 years ago at this point. And so this is not cutting edge science. And so this is uh, founded by a physiologist named Christian Bohr. And so that's why it's known as the Bohr effect. And so what he found out is, is that in our bodies, uh, carbon dioxide is actually needed to separate oxygen from the hemoglobin in the blood. So when we breathe in, we can take the oxygen into our lungs. It gets attached to the hemoglobin in our blood. It then gets transferred around our body to the muscles. And then the oxygen has to go from the blood into our muscular tissues. Like the Amazon delivery guy. That's yeah. how I think of it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> And so, Thinking of, keep talking. I've got to go sign something for the Amazon delivery guy. Keep talking and I'll be right back. See, this is like <laughs> oxygen getting delivered to your yeah. muscle structure. Of your yeah. <laughs> keep going though. Yeah. So what Christian Bohr found is that that carbon dioxide allows the oxygen to separate from the hemoglobin easier. 
So higher levels of carbon dioxide mean that our oxygen gets used more effective in our musculature. So therefore, we actually need less oxygen at our cellular level to perform effectively. Now, anybody who's listening to that is thinking, I'm lost, I've lost it. Take it as simple as this. If you can increase your CO2 tolerance, the pack on your back lasts longer. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be the person walking out of the fire with the pack frozen to your back anymore. And so it blows my mind that I can walk into just about any firehouse across the country and number one, nobody's paying attention to their breathing. Most of the guys uh, sitting around the kitchen table are mouth breathing. Most of them are shallow breathing and over breathing. And so that's by all those indicators, it's showing that they have very low levels of CO2 tolerance, which means that their hemoglobin actually is not releasing the oxygen very well at the tissues. And that's mind blowing. And obviously if we wanna be better firefighters, more effective at our jobs, this is basic skill one. We put our packs on on day one. And if we can train to breathe better so we can make the packs last longer on our backs, that's a basic skill that should be being taught in every academy. And in fact, I just saw an Instagram post from um, on Patrick McCown's page. So I'm certified breath coach in the Oxygen Advantage uh, methodology, which is Patrick McCown's uh, methodology. And he was actually, he wasn't, but one of his instructors was actually working with, I believe it was the Brussels, Germany Fire Academy in proper breathing techniques so that they're introducing this stuff in academy now, which I was like, yes, like this is finally what needs to be happening. So the reason why this is for increased stamina is, and why we're going to train on holding the breath out is, is that over time, we should be able to get longer and longer and longer with holding our breath out, which means that we're actually increasing that CO2 tolerance so that we can actually have a little bit more CO2 in our system before those baroreceptors in our brain trip and make us breathe and take it back down again. So this all culminates uh, through, again, a simple breathing test you can provide and do on your own. Uh, and so when you wake up in the morning, this is called the, uh, it's called the BOLT score. Um, it's an acronym. So to try this and see what your score is, is tomorrow morning, first thing when you wake up, before you even get out of bed, uh, you're going to get inhale completely and exhale completely. Just a normal breath, inhale and exhale, and then hold your breath for as long as possible and count to yourself one second, two second, three second, four seconds, or use a stopwatch timer on your phone. And the moment you feel that first ping to inhale, so that first muscular, like, uh, I need to inhale, time stops. And so what they've shown is, is that the average American at this point is at about 10 to 15, less than 15 seconds. It gets scary though, because if we're considered to have a low bolt score, which is less than about 20 seconds or so, it shows dysfunctional breathing. So you wanna be able to hold that breath for about 20 seconds before um, you feel that ping to take that first breath. Um, elite level athletes can get all the way up in towards a minute uh, on the score. Um, so that's kind of the range, but um, don't feel bad if when you try this tomorrow, your score's down at four, five, six, eight, ten 10 seconds. Cause I find that's actually very normal uh, for those in law enforcement and fire service because we just haven't been trained in this stuff. And because of our lifestyles and our jobs we've undertaken, which means we really need to train in this. And so for increased stamina is when you're sitting at the kitchen table or you're getting, uh, this is a true training exercise. So treat it like going to the gym, honestly, because it's not under pressure. It's not under stress. This is to enhance your performance long-term. And so we start uh, in this one with the holding our breath out for a count of 10, again, scalable. If where you're at today, it's four seconds. Great. That's your baseline. Start there. But just over time, start to slow that breath down and hold, and you'll be able to see that exhale being held longer. So the way this one gets coached is you just inhale slowly, exhale slowly, and hold the breath out. One, two, three, four, five, wherever you stop. And take your breath in, take your breath out, and hold. And uh, 
four to five minutes of this is plenty. You'll actually feel a bit fatigued uh, from it because it is training, uh, but it's critically important for those, especially in the fire service, uh, to learn and to train on this to increase that CO2 tolerance uh, long-term. I was going to say we did, um, with one of the departments I work with, we did a bolt score at the beginning of their program at the end. And the beginning, like if I'm remembering at least one person's number, they were all around this, was like seven. And by the end of the program, it was 23. And this we just did informally, like after class. So not even when they first woke up or whatever, but there was a clear improvement. And um, the other thing I'll say too, is in the training part, like when you're doing the bolt score, definitely do it when you feel the first hunger for breath. And that's when you stop. When you're training with the exercise Eric just told you, if you are at eight or nine and you want to get to 10, when you start to feel the hunger for breath, some tricks to do is to stand up taller and feel your ribs widen and even swallow. And that will kind of help you get over that little hunger for two or so more counts. So that's to help with training. Don't use it when you're doing your bolt score though, because you really want to see where you are without doing those tricks. All right. That's a lot of information there for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That, I, that, I, that like, people are going to have to listen to this like four times. Yeah, that's yeah. all right. I mean, that's that, that's why we're doing it. No, that I'm, one's, I'm, but, I'm not complaining at all. No, sure. that one is, that one's intense. And yeah. maybe that's why we haven't studied in the fire service. But honestly, the fact that it's 120 years old and yeah. I, nobody knows about this just yeah. blows yeah. my mind because it ha I has feel such like a more... profound impact on our jobs. There's more talk about this when people who like do scuba diving. I think there's more. Oh, yeah, sure. so, yeah. Yeah. You know? So we actually have a, so we actually have a guy uh, in our tactical resilience developing high performance uh, that does like the free diving. And it's critical for those folks because they're holding their breath for two, three, four yeah. minutes at a time. Um, and so uh, that's where you hear about it a, a lot, but because it has such a profound impact on our jobs, specifically when we're walking around with a limited amount of air on our backs, it's like, it's insane to me that, that like, I want to teach this class just on this topic, the bore yeah. effect and improving our CO2 tolerance to the fire service. Like I want to, I want to go on a speaking tour and bring that about to people. Yeah. You should. Right, so go ahead. What? I said, you should, you've heard it here first. We're launching <laughs> yeah. a speaking tour. All right. <laughs> Branch it out. Yeah. So next we got anxiety, dealing with anxiety. And this looks like that we're going to get into box breathing, which I'm sure is probably one of the more well-known techniques, but go ahead and, and yeah. lead us into that. Yeah, so I'll let Olivia coach it at the end. Box breathing is extremely common at this place, thanks to our special forces brothers and sisters. Uh, let's be honest, that's the Navy SEALs were the ones that brought box breathing to the forefront. Uh, but as you can tell by this point, we need to learn why this is working the way it's working. And so uh, super simple, uh, we're talking about slowing down the breath cycles, right? And so the traditional way of teaching box breathing is a four count box. Uh, if you do the math on that, it's four, eight, 12, 16. So just about 3.8, three and a half breaths a minute uh, if you run that cycle through. And so because of that, uh, the vast majority of it is on the exhale or the hold. Uh, we're actually really engaging the brake pedal. And so the reason why this has really, really come into focus with special forces is, is think about a special force operation their gas pedal is jammed all the way on like those guys are super activated hard charging like doing a nighttime mission be like a firefighter or a cop doing exactly what we're trained to do too but we're still very very activated in it so if we're all the way jammed over pegged over to red line we need a tool that's going to pull us back the other way and so if we can are jammed over on red line we activate box breathing and that's our brake pedal. If we have gas pedal and brake pedal working simultaneously, what it actually then does is it brings our body, mind, and nervous system into a really sweet spot. And so that's the whole point of box breathing is that when you're super activated, when you're in that high stress situation, hitting the brake pedal hard, and box breathing is pretty easy to remember. It's another reason why it's commonly taught, let's be honest, uh, because in those moments, it's hard to think like, oh, what was the count of that? And I can just think of like, oh, it's a box uh, and count that out. And so 
we're going to teach it at the traditional way of four, 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 but I'm sure Olivia will say this is scalable as well. Yeah. And box breathing is such a great combination of almost everything else we've been talking about in one, right? Because it has the breath retention on the inhale and the exhale. It has an even inhale and an even exhale. So like Eric said, it's a great combination of brake pedal, but also training the nervous system for high performance at the same time. Um, so I think that's why box breathing has gotten so popular because everything we've been talking about is kind of all in one with box breathing. Um, and as Eric said, it is scalable. So if 4444 does not seem achievable today, you can lessen you know any part of the box. Um, but basically we're using three part breath and we inhale for a count of four. As you hold for a count of four, that's when I recommend the tricks I mentioned earlier. We're, remember, we're not holding and adding tension. This is this is really important, and it's also important for that holding of the increased stamina one. We're not clenching our jaw and mm, I'm gonna hold, 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 hold. We have to do this dance of keep getting our nervous system trained and it might feel a little activating to hold the breath in. And at the same time, I'm not adding any extra tension. I'm performance ready, but I'm not wasting energy with tension. In for four, hold for four. I exhale evenly for four. When the final drop of air is out, then I hold the breath out for four. Another important thing after breath retention is we don't go <gasps> like, oh my God, I needed that breath. It's an even count for four, an even hold, a slow controlled release, hold the exhale out for four. And then sometimes I like to even just give one extra pause right before I pull the breath in, just so I'm not sucking air in out of that urgent state. So it's very even four, 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 four. If you're not, if breath retention in or out does feel a little overly activating, you can in for four, hold for two, or even pause, exhale for four, pause or hold for one or two or do two 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 the reason i like to keep the inhales and exhales at the four count though at least is because that at least is creating that nice balance of the nervous system and it's really the breath retention that we're trying to train so maybe four two four two four, three, four, three, et cetera, until you can get to the full box. Um, there's a traditional breath technique that's four, seven, eight. And what we've added to it is a breath retention at the bottom of five for that bore effect for increasing CO2 tolerance. Um, again, this is not for when you're out in the field and trying to remember four, seven, eight, five, this is training. Um, but you'd inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale eight and hold for five. That's that's what I call, um, and we call it yoga for first responders, advanced box breathing, but it's just turning the dial up a little bit more on box breathing. Um, but having it in the field with you, keep it four, 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 four. Yeah. And when we do talk about training the bore effect and training this, um, there's a myth, there's a legend in the developing high performance world of a guy that went from bell to mask sucked to his face over two hours. And we talked to him after that. Uh, we we're like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm basically using box breathing, but he's all the way up to like 16 counts. Like he was, it was insane what this dude was doing. So one breath a minute, essentially. Yeah. But I mean, we have... elite, elite level dude, don't take that personally if you're not at 16s on your back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. But also like we do have several testimonials of someone who was trained by us in this breath work. And the next time they went to training, I think she went up to 45 minutes after Vibra Alert. And after Vibra Alert. Yeah. Which is Really yeah. yeah. And she did the training and went straight to that. And what she did, she said she did a combination actually of all of these different breath techniques, probably based on what her mental state was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Do I need, am I about to freak out? Okay. Yeah. I'm not freaking out now. I just need to maintain. So maybe I'll do coherency breath. So she did a combination of all of these things to get her um, to last 45 minutes. So um, I think like for me, when I'm just going through the exercise like that, at first, especially if you go from like work to, okay, stop and, and try to save everything you can. 
there, there's got to be that period of I can't hardly do it without or with withholding my breath. Mm-hmm. You know, I can I can do that whole saving a few little bit of time at the top with breath, but it, it's hard for me to to get the whole box at first. And then once I kind of calm down a little bit more, then you're able to to stretch it out. But yeah, just just being able to to use any and all of these whenever you need is going to help you in, in those situations. And seamlessly moving between them yeah. as your nervous system. You know, again, I've not in fire service. I only went through the academy specifically to grow this work. But one thing I noticed I would do in training um, an overhaul specifically is when I noticed it because I would make my pack last really long, even compared to other women, my, you know, my size. So not even having to do with how much breath I'm sucking in. But whenever there was movement, I, because of my lifelong yoga practice, I was always attaching movement to breathing. Everything was a dance of moving and breathing. It was happening automatically. And that's when the training captain tapped me and it was like, everyone's done. Like they're, they're tapped out. Like, so if you want to stop and all I was doing was moving and breathing. And I think that's what also helped my pack last longer. Yeah. And this is, it did come up in our instructor school is like a lot of the criticism we hear often is like, oh, this is all nice and great, but this isn't reality on the fire ground. Well, we had a firefighter last two weeks ago at our training in Pensacola. And this is, he said exactly what I advocate for is that, in any call that we're running, there is a moment in that call that you have to take one of these breath techniques and put them into play. And in fact, I'd argue the opposite, that if you're not putting one of these breath techniques into play at some point during every call, you're actually more of the liability than not. Like there is even an overhaul that you can find the time or even doing your primary search, you can find a time to do one, three, two, five breath to make sure that you're focused so you don't miss the person that's three feet off to your left side, you know, like you can put these into place. I have an example of this. I did a a quick ride along with FDNY and you would think, oh, FDNY, lots of calls, crazy, blah, 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 blah. Because it's New York City, you're not going very far fast. So you actually do have more time than you think, you know? So I jump on the truck with them and they're putting their packs on and everything. It's a fire in the subway. And one guy says to me, I've been on the job so many years and I still get this anxiety right, right now, like right when I'm putting the pack on. And so I said, do you keep doing, keep getting ready. And I'm going to coach you through some things so i taught him that as he's tightening the straps he's inhaling and exhaling he's doing three-part breath in combination and again it doesn't slow him down it has nothing to do with time so even then you can plug in the breath work if you've trained for it ahead of time you can do it automatically without slowing yourself down at all and in fact as we all know slow is smooth smooth is fast you might actually end up going quicker yeah so we got that that basically takes care of of the card which again is is an invaluable resource i'm i'm very thankful to to have them i've i've blown some up and and my son has one hanging on his wall i've got them all over the place but oh that's awesome to hear actually because that's the goal is that it impacts yeah. your life yeah yeah but definitely if if you have not seen this or if you don't have this if you if you didn't catch the link that he said i will put it in the notes everywhere and and share it as much as i can because it's very very important but the last thing we got on the checklist is the research study so what what do you have what do you guys got as far as that yeah and you know Everything we say, as you probably already can understand, we're not going to tell you anything that hasn't been backed up with science. And um, so you can believe us and you can believe that this is happening and we have the research studies. Um, And uh, there's one thing I want to mention about the card at the end, so don't let me forget, but let me go into this research study. This is exciting news. This just wrapped up recently. 
It was a clinical research study on our protocol specifically. We do have a published paper on our online training, which we did during COVID. Um, and this one was in person. So it was with four fire departments and one police department, uh, 16 weeks of training. And here are the findings. And it's just, it's so recent that um, it's not published yet. It's in the works of being published, but let me pull up some slides here real quick for um, those who are watching. So this study was breath work, the whole three primary things of yoga, the breath work, the physical, the meditation part, which we call neural reset. And it also had the CDs, the cognitive behavioral technique that we use um, that Eric had mentioned earlier. Okay, so I'm gonna pull these up and share my screen. So here were the results, some of the results, the most impactful. Um, here are is the this orange line is the group that got the intervention that got the yoga, and this blue line is the control group they didn't get the yoga. This is PTSD symptoms, and as you can see, um, the group that got the yoga had a huge decline in symptomology. Um, three months though down the road, you can see it starts to creep up again, except for the folks that here's control group gray. And here, orange is people who practiced, continue to practice the yoga using our app. That's what I want to make sure everyone has access to by the end of this. Um, the who, who practice less than once a week uh, with the app is the orange. The folks that practiced at least once a week, all three aspects of yoga, breath work, physical, and the neural reset are the blue. Now, you can see the folks that practiced all three aspects at least once a week had the most significant state, um, continuous uh, decline of their post-traumatic stress symptoms. It was steady the whole time. It stayed low. Um, right after all three, the runner-up are the folks that practiced breath work at least once a week. Um What's even more cool about this, and I don't have the slide that shows this specifically, but the folks that were sub-threshold for post-traumatic stress. So alas, a lot of people that are active duty are diagnosable with post-traumatic stress and working, just FYI. But the folks that were sub-threshold, meaning they are showing symptomology and they're showing that post-traumatic stress is down the road for them, but they're not diagnosable yet, had the most decrease in the symptoms and the most stability in the symptoms staying low. What this means is, is that these techniques are a proven tool to prevent post-traumatic stress. All three of the yoga components is the perfect combination, but breath work only is a great runner up. Um, I said this on the presentation I did er earlier today when I presented th these findings, and I can be so bold to say this now that we have the data, is that if you are not using this as a tool, not only personally, but if you are in a leadership position to change curriculum in an academy and in-service training, and you are not giving this tool, it's reckless. Because you there is a tool out there to prevent your personnel from having horrible mental health issues that could lead from as little as a physical injury to suicide and there's a prevention for it so use it there's no other choice anything to add there Eric? no i mean if that's not a mic drop if that's not a mic drop moment i don't know what is i mean the fact that we can we now can have proof that there is uh, there is a proactive training tool for post-traumatic stress in the world um but again, it takes it out of this conversation realm and makes it yeah. tactical and practical. Uh, and that's been our goal. Um, and so that's why, honestly, Jeremy, we're so grateful for you continuing to allow us to come onto your platform and share because you get it. And we need to continue to get this message out to folks and to get to spend this much time working through the science and Listen, folks, I know it's super deep and super tough to get through some of this stuff. And if you've made it this far, amazing. Hopefully you've hit pause and re gone back a few times. Um, honestly, this is going to become one of my favorite episodes to share with people, Jeremy. Yeah. Because yeah. you gave us the opportunity to kind of dive a little bit deeper than we've ever been given 
the opportunity before. And I think that's important because it's not just yoga. Uh, it's yeah. there's, there's a very, very specific reason and a methodology that we we've put together to get through and break through and to public safety. We've talked two hours and we've gotten deep, but listen, we've simplified it on this postcard, just do this. And now I want you to know why it works and then you can have that in the back of your mind, but you don't need to know why it works for it to work. You just, just do it. Right. And speaking of tactical and practical, you're like, okay, great. This is great, but I can't even remember what you said. Okay. I have the postcard. We, our app talks you through these exercises and more. And, um, that's why Jeremy, we want to give your audience a free month of the, app so that they can use this. And then after that, the app is very minimal cost, $4 a month, um, you know, for your training. So the code for that, Eric, is? Through first. Like one ST? Uh, first, F-I-R-S-T. Crew, okay. C-R-E-W. You, you, you probably should do it one ST just because that's what oh. everything I have is. Awesome. See, yeah, I knew his brand thing. His that's brand that. branding. If that doesn't mess anything up. Not at no, all. No, so I just... can quickly edit and change it. I have the keys to the, to the castle. Yeah. The Crew, C-R-E- you got, the audience says C-R-E-W-1. The number one. S-T. S-T. And uh, use the that, link in this. folks. Yeah, use the link in the show notes. That will will that automatically apply it, Eric, if they use the link in the show notes or no? God, God willing. God willing. Okay, technology great. out. If not, use the <laughs> coupon code crew one ST at check Or if, uh, if if not, reach out and and we will get it straightened out for sure. 100%. Yeah, it's in your pocket. And you know, on the um presentation I did earlier, someone um who's the wellness coordinator for the local sheriff's office, who was, it was actually Dan Bright, Eric, he's well known in the health and wellness and law enforcement. And when I mentioned the app, one thing he said is the number one feedback I got on the app is that people were embarrassed to do yoga in front of other people. And they got to try it out in the privacy of their own home and feel comfortable enough to then attend whatever class or do it, you know, at their department. So um, use it as a gateway. Perfect. All right, man. I, again, I really appreciate your time and thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the, the code for everybody out there that is willing to take advantage of it. I really challenge anybody and everybody to do that. I, do that and download this card and just have a resource handy when you need it. So anything else? I mean, I think it's perfect timing because everybody's home and it's about to be pandemonium here, but yeah. you know, if there's anything else to that you didn't get to say and no, well, listen, after talking for two hours, like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm exhausted because, <laughs> yeah. because it, it gets to the stress response. But like yeah. Eric said, I mean, to use your platform to get these tools out to people is all we can hope for. And we really appreciate you and just the fact that you're even interested in this. So thanks for everything you do, Jeremy. You bet. Thank you very much. And anybody out there, I will try to to put as much information on the notes as I can. But if there is something that you are curious about and don't have a way to find it, let me know and I will get you in contact with with either Eric or Olivia or, or Cindy where you need to be. So thank you for your time. Thank you guys for your time and for the knowledge and, and everything you brought and look forward to the next conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Scare me. <laughs>